Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living podcast at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach and teacher, intuitive guide, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This podcast is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level, to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. Whether you are listening to this show while driving or commuting, doing chores around the house, relaxing on a couch, or flying in a spaceship across the galaxy, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Let's talk about intuition. When we are exploring the nature of intuition, we now understand that there is a scientific side and a spiritual or metaphysical side to it. The spiritual aspect of intuition has been with us since the beginning of time, while we have just begun discovering the science of it, since the emergence of quantum physics in particular. I feel that, at this point, we pretty much understand the spiritual aspect of intuition to the extent that we can, of course. And short of some unexpected insights and earth-shattering revelations by the Spirit, we don't really expect to learn anything new. However, the scientific study and research into intuition is an exciting and still developing field. And so I definitely would like to learn about the science of intuition, what modern science can tell us about it. Come to think of it, that's an interesting thought, to receive an insight about intuition, <laughs> a kind of a self-feeding loop. I'm curious to find out what techniques and processes scientists have developed to study intuition. Can we measure it or quantify it somehow? Can we tell where it comes from? After all, science wants to be precise. And of course, we need to move beyond psychology into neuroscience with all the available diagnostic instruments and tools. The first thing that comes to my mind when I think intuition is meditation and other altered state of consciousness, even such as deep relaxation or daydreaming. Or, conversely, a heightened state of mind on alert, which somehow opens the door to our sixth sense we call intuition. And I will share with you my personal experience in such a state, which was simply amazing. My special guest today, I have invited to unpack this fascinating topic for us, is Dr. Arnaud Delorme. Arnaud Delorme, PhD, has been studying human consciousness for the past 20 years. He is a neuroscientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, a research director at the University of Toulouse, and a senior research scientist at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Delorme has a keen interest in the scientific study of consciousness and spirituality. He is a long-time Zen meditator and has taught in India in a master's degree program for the Birla Institute of Technology. Dr. Delorme is the author of over 160 publications. In this conversation, we'll be drawing on his latest book, Why Our Minds Wander, Understand the Science and Learn How to Focus Your Thoughts, which will hopefully shed some light on our exploration of the science of intuition. You can find out more about Dr. Delorme and his work with links to his website and books in the show notes and his guest profile on my podcast website at quantumlivingpodcast.com. Hello, Arno. Thank you for coming to my show. So welcome to Quantum Living. It's such a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you for having me. Ah, wonderful. What a, what a fascinating topic. We've got a lot to cover in this conversation, so let's dive right into it. What is intuition and where does it come from? Is it part 
of our consciousness? Yeah, so that's uh, um, that's the million dollar question. And I can tell you the limited perspective we have in science. I mean, we, we're just like scratching the surface. And, you know, of course, you know, there's other perspective, you know, except for the uh, scientific explanation. So, so the standard view of intuition uh, in science and in psychology is associated with creativity. You know, that's where does creativity comes from? And I think that's the way it's mostly studied with creativity. And uh, for example, experiments we've run ourselves uh, on creativity, and we'll go to other types of intuition, but you know, let's just stick to creativity for a second. Uh, so on creativity, for example, we put people in front of a screen, we show them a brick and we ask them, what can you do with that brick? And they enter, uh, I can build a house, you know, I can use it as a paperweight. Uh, if I'm stuck outside, I can use it to break a window. And then what we do is we rate, you know, the um, originality of their answer. And that's the rating of their uh, creativity. So that's one way people study creativity. And it's not really linked to, you know, intuition, but you can link it to intuition. So that's one way to uh, study intuition uh, in a way is like, do people give like standard answer or do they give something that's a little bit more creative? And then there's the other type of intuition, which I've studied uh, as well. Uh, this has to do with, you know, more the intuition we we're talking about, uh, which is the intuition of mediums and psychics. Do they give intuition which are accurate or not accurate? So I work personally with uh, mediums so mediums uh, for, you know, so for the uh, people who don't know what mediums do is they do uh, readings about past relative. And one thing they do when you go see a medium is that uh, they try to give you evidential information. They try to convince you they're in contact with your DC's relative. Uh, what I was interested in testing was not whether, uh, you know, spirit existed or not. You know, I think it might be beyond you know the scientific realm to actually address that question. Is whether they they had access to information that they were not supposed to have access. So you know, it could be uh, telepathy, it could be anything. It's just like do they were they able to have access? Were their intuition you know able to tap into something real or not? And it's much easier to test mediums than psychics because psychics, they'll tell you, you know, their intuition about the future that's going to happen to you. But it's very hard to test in practice because you got to go see the person, uh, you know, six months later, did this happen to you or not? And then whatever the psychic said could have influenced your life. You know, it's like maybe you, you said what the psychic said you would do. So it's very hard to test. Mediums are much easier to test because the first thing they try to do is to convince you oh, they're communicating with your DC's relative. So they give you lots of information. You go see a medium, you uh, say, you know, I want to uh, reading about my grandfather. And the medium will say, oh, I'm in contact with your grandfather. And uh, he's like this, he's like this, he's like this. So they're trying to convince you, oh, I'm really in contact with your grandfather. Because most people, even if they're not scientists, are very skeptical. You know, even when you want to reading about, even if you believe this is real, you, you're just like, ah, oh, you know, is it really my grandfather or not? So they try to convince you. So they give you a lot of information. And so that's what we do in the lab. You know, we have the medium come and we tell them, somebody wants a reading about Robert. And that's what we tell them. And the person that tells them that has even no idea what who Robert is. This way we cannot have you know, a subtle, you know, like the medium cannot go what we call fish for information. They can't, you know, just say something, look at your facial expression, is it real or not? So we just give them a name, Robert, and the person that gives the name and collect the answer doesn't even know who Robert is. Uh, but there's somebody that wants a reading about Robert. That's not in the same room. And then the uh, mediums is going to give a lot of information uh, about Robert. And then we go back to the person to double check, is this information correct uh, or not? So this is how, you know, we test this this mm -hmm. type of uh, intuition, the intuitions of uh, mediums. I'm going to let you talk a little bit. I can talk for an hour, but yeah, let me. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So to continue on this note, 
From the spiritual or metaphysical perspective, intuition is said to be communication from the spirit, from other dimensions, from our higher self or soul, essentially from our spiritual self, which knows it all and guides us with relevant and important information to help us navigate through this life experience. Does science support the spiritual nature of intuition in any way? Can it overlap with spirituality to help us understand this phenomenon with our logical mind? Yeah, that's a, another very interesting question. You know, can science even address these questions or not? And uh, another million dollar question. So you're going to be rich at the end of the podcast. Uh, so, um, <laughs> great. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the type of question that science can answer. So first people think science, you know, very often in the same way they think as religion, especially in this, uh, day and age, science is seen as having all the answers, but science is not a belief system. Science is a method. Uh, so science is the method of reproducibility. So when you do science, the idea is that, and you publish a paper, scientific paper, uh, you give all the method. This is everything I did. And the idea is that somebody can take your paper, redid everything you do, yeah, do the same as everything you did, and obtain the same result. That's about it. That's about you know what science is. And, and uh, so that's how we use it. We use it as a method. Uh, you know, we use statistics. So statistics tells you there's one chance in a million. This just happens by chance. Let's say, you know, you have somebody that's really good doing readings and 100% of the time they're correct. You can say, well, the odds of them being correct are uh, extremely small. You know, they are like one in a million. And that's how we do in the paper. We don't say this is true or this is false. Uh, we say, well, you know, it's very unlikely that this is not true because the odds are very low. So that's all what science can say. So as long as we can frame the question in the sense that, you know, it can be tested and measured. Uh, so measure is another, uh, uh, you know, things that can be tested. But for example, you know, so the, what you were talking about, you know, uh, testing intuition in spiritual realm, realm, which is what we did, you know, with the uh, mediums, we were testing intuition. Well, it depends well, how you define spiritual realm, but we were testing intuition and our measure apparatus was people. You know, we're using people to provide the answer and people to measure. And that's okay. We can still do statistics with that. We can still say, well, the odds of them getting the right answer is very low. So that's perfectly fine. Uh, so it doesn't have to be you know, you need to regard uh, with a Geiger counter. That's what you use for radioactivity. You can use humans as recording device, you know, and they give, if they give consistent answers, you can publish a scientific paper and says the odds against chance for this are very low. And if you do the experiment again, uh, you should be able to conclude uh, the same thing potentially with other uh, mediums. So can science answer the question? It depends on the question. You know, the question needs to be framed in a way that uh, can be answered by science using the scientific method. If it can be framed that way, then, yeah, it can be tested. Okay, so you spoke a moment ago about different types of intuition, and there's also a kind of intuition that comes directly to us. For example, have you done any tests in meditation in terms of the information or the insight or intuition that we can receive in our meditative state? And the question is, can science tell us or at least indicate whether the information or the insight we are receiving in our meditative state comes from our thoughts, our unconscious mind, our memory, or another dimension. Can this be tested? 
I think it can be tested to some extent and not necessarily another dimension. It's more like, does it come from our thoughts or does it come potentially from uh, not our brain? You know, it's like, what is it? We don't know. You know, it's it's unlikely to be our brain or is it from our brain, which means potentially our thoughts. Uh, we actually published a paper, you know, is consciousness in the brain or not? trying to uh and this was a paper so this is meant for scientists you know so scientists read it but it was very popular uh among scientists so scientists are very shy of these questions but you know you'll see often scientists i remember uh when i was working at the sock institute which is a prestigious institute in san diego where francis crick i was in his lab at that time uh, Francis Crick, the discoverer of the DNA and Nobel Prize, etc. So then he was later interested in consciousness, and I was in his lab. So at the Salk Institute, uh, they had what called Salk Fest once a year, like the party. And the main people, you had like hundreds of scientists queuing to, the, there was a booth with four mediums, queuing <laughs> to go see mediums. They had to wait for several hours. Uh, <laughs> so even scientists are interested in these questions, even if they're shy to uh, uh, to admit it. Uh, and um, yeah, did so, you go? Yeah, of course. Uh, and, and were you happy with? I mean, were you able to verify the accuracy of the reading? And that specific reading, I wasn't very convinced. But I've been with many okay. mediums uh, since. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so the, <laughs> sorry, I'm putting you on a spot. <laughs> oh no, no, no. Uh, coming back to your question, you know, can mm -hmm. it be assessed whether it comes from our thoughts or from outside mm -hmm. our brain potentially? Um, yeah, you know, that's what we try to do with our um, mediums, where you know we were asking them questions, they were, you know, giving answers, and the idea is that if they are able to have intuition about the correct answer, then, you know, it probably doesn't come from their brain. It comes from some phenomena that we don't yet understand, you know, um, you know, whether it's the global unconscious or not. Then what about meditation? Well, I think it's the same. Actually, most of our medium, they started their session with meditation. So they were meditating at, uh, at the beginning. And we did a survey, actually, of 1,200 meditators to double check, you know, if people had any kind of uh, non, you know, I would say paranormal experience, experience during their um, meditation. And more than half said they had had it at least once. More than half. More than 50% said they had uh, telepathy during their meditation. They felt they had telepathy. They felt they had like a special connection with their guru. Uh, so, I mean, it doesn't mean that they actually had it. They just claim to have it. But at least more than 50%, they, they have had at this at least once. Wow. Okay. And by the way, what was the conclusion of that article you, you mentioned? The conclusion of the article, it was more like, uh, so our article, uh, which we published, Is Consciousness in the Brain, mm -hmm. was uh, listing all, uh, you know, various, this is a very long topic because <laughs> uh you know co is consciousness in the brain or not is is highly debated between scientists so it, it was inconclusive in other words uh it was more an opinion paper saying consciousness you know okay. is, we don't think consciousness is in the brain and this is the reason why you know let's open the debate mm -hmm. uh it wasn't like oh i don't think we have any demonstration of one way or the other but it's a highly debated topic in research. What is consciousness? Actually, if you look at the 10 questions of science, consciousness is number two, one or two, along with dark matter, dark energy, you know, all these other questions in physics. Consciousness is in the top of the unanswered question of science. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, you know, actually, when I was preparing for, for this interview, when I wanted to have this conversation, initially, I thought maybe to talk about what is consciousness, but, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I quickly gave up <laughs> that idea yeah. because this is obviously a, a never-ending topic. So, uh, yes. Now, I've got a hairy question for you now. Is it possible 
to receive an intuitive message that belongs to someone else, like a communication cross wire in the quantum field. <laughs> so in the quantum field, uh, there are several theories, mm -hmm. you know, uh, associated with the quantum field and consciousness, where, which could support that. Uh, you know, there's the uh, zero zero point field of Johann Kepler. Uh, there's a couple of others. There's the or car theory of Hameroff, uh, of you know, which link the quantum field with uh, consciousness. Uh, I don't think there is, you know, any definite. Uh, proof that you know uh, these are correct yet that they haven't been shown to be incorrect either uh, what we know of link uh, first we know quantum biology is a real field right now so quantum biology is 10 years ago we thought oh you can only do quantum in particle accelerator at the CERN that's where the only place where you know quantum effect actually show anything and you know about 10 years ago, 10 to 15 years ago, there were actually demonstrations that uh, it happens in biology, like, for example, the photosynthesis of plants. You know, so there is molecular pathways for plants to harness the sun energy. You know, it's a cascade of uh, biochemical reaction. The sun hits some molecules, uh, you know, which in turn activates uh, the cell machinery, the plant cells, which in turn create energy. And there, it was shown that in you know in this process, quantum process actually happened, and people thought it was completely impossible 15 years ago because we call that hot system, like the body, plants, its body temperature. Usually, quantum effect only happen you know in the very very cold when atoms barely move. Like if you look at the quantum computers, when you hear quantum computers, they're cooled down to almost absolute zero. So uh, so we now know, yeah, quantum effect can have a role at, you know, body temperature. And so, yeah, that's what these theories claim, that, uh, you know, quantum effect happening in the brain could interact with consciousness, possibly. But, uh, and so, yeah, possibly. Uh, what we know, what we know is uh, there are some effects which could, you know, involve quantum mechanics, like, uh, for example, magnetoreceptor so magnetoreceptor you know pigeons pigeons can orient themselves with what we call the magnet uh, uh, the magnetosphere uh, in the sense uh, that's the earth magnetic field so the earth magnetic field is when you have a compass you know it orients itself to the north that's based on the earth magnetic field same thing so the birds they can use the earth magnetic field with magnetoreceptor and you know so these are special cell they have in their brain where they sense it's like a sixth sense they sense the earth magnetic field and this probably relies also on some quantum phenomena you know to in these cells to sense the magnetic field and it was demonstrated recently like two years ago that humans also have these so humans can sense the magnetic field and what's very interesting is that the the magnetic field of the earth is very influenced by the sun so we can sense, our body can sense when the sun is having lots of activity, for example. And this has also been shown. There was a paper two years ago in a very reputable journal that showed that sunspots are followed by body reactions in humans. So we can sense the sun. We can sense the earth magnetic field. So that's a support for uh, telepathy, like in the sense, like, uh, for example, you know, if there's like a lot of activity in the sun, all the humans are going to be somewhat upset. So, and that's not, no longer controversial. You know, it's like the mediumship study I was talking about. Most scientists don't believe, you know, that's that's true. So there needs to be more study to replicate these findings. But these ones, and most scientists, you know, are convinced, you know, this is real phenomena. Yes. I'm going to ask you to put your spiritual hat on top of your scientific hat for a moment, <laughs> at least. 
Let me talk about the quantum field. This is not a new concept because, as I'm sure you would know, all the ancient spiritual texts and teachings talk about the universal mind. Another term for it is consciousness. But the universal mind term is specifically pertinent here because one of the theories is that what happens with uh, intuition and all psychic activities and psychic phenomena is that our own mind receives information from that universal mind, that pool of all information. So I'm just curious, and obviously I'm uh, asking you not only to, to quote scientific evidence, but to offer your own view, your own opinion about it. I'm looking for for the nexus between science and spirituality to pinpoint where does intuition come from? Yeah. So the theory you're mentioning is interesting and it's you know relatively aligned with my belief system in the sense uh, you know it's it's addressed in in my book as well the different models of of consciousness one the model that's the you know the one I would put my money on right now is uh, that consciousness is you know potentially like another field of nature so you got the electromagnetic field uh you got you know it's like you got gravitation although you know well, some people wouldn't say this is not a field but yeah you have these different force of natures and then uh which are you know can be seen as field which extend to infinity and then consciousness you know would be something uh similar as these other fields and so in that sense our uh, brain, you know, could be seen as like a little antenna that just tuned into that field. Now, you know, it is still, even with that theory, uh, is like, why can't we feel everybody else all the time? <laughs> this is true. So, you know, I don't think that question is answered. With this model, there's still lots of uh, unknown, but it does align with uh, my belief system. I also like from the... Uh, you know, purely scientific perspective, but it is an elegant theory in the sense that at the Big Bang, you know, all the fields are uh, united. Yeah, all the forces of nature are united. And so, you know, for consciousness will be united with the other forces. It's not the prevalent view. The prevalent view of the scientific, you know, scientists, neuroscientists, is that um, consciousness exists. They call it qualia the sense of feeling, which wasn't the case, by the way, 30 years ago. 30 years ago, if you asked neuroscientists, they would say, I can't talk about consciousness. Consciousness is a pure illusion. I don't exist. Nobody exists. Uh, you know, they would be very puzzled by that question. But the field has moved on. And now I would say most scientists believe consciousness exists. Their own consciousness exists. But, you know, most scientists believe that free will doesn't exist. Oh, really? Okay. Yes, because um, because it's easier. You know, this way you don't need the consciousness <laughs> field. It's just like, uh, but you know, it's still like, well, if the if free will doesn't exist, you know, where does it? Where does this sense of free will come from? And they don't have any answer for that either. And there's mm. also lots. Of, there's also theories which have like interesting twist where. Uh, you know, they claim free will exists, but it's purely uh, predictable. Anyway, this is lots of, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like a zoo. It's actually a big, very big fun. rabbit hole, a yeah, deep, deep rabbit hole. Yeah. So <laughs> we have no idea. I was at the Science of Consciousness conference uh, last week in Arizona. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, yeah, we, nobody has any idea. That's, you know, <laughs> like the take home message. Yeah, we can just speculate and have fun with it. Yeah, basically, and and it is a lot of fun, both intellectual and, and spiritual fun. Now you mentioned Arno your book, why our minds wander. Let's talk about it. And what I'm interested in is mind wandering, which is close to daydreaming. I I believe a door to our higher self and intuition and how can we cultivate it with meditation for example yeah uh thank you for this question so mind wandering uh so it's actually linked to you know the what we've been talking about consciousness intuition 
because uh, so mind wandering is about the thoughts you know that pop up in our brain all the time or in our mind uh, and uh, where do they come from like intuition where does it come from you know what's the support of that consciousness where does it appear so mind wandering is inter you know mingled with all these uh, questions and you know first first what is mind wandering well mind wandering is uh, when you're meditating and uh you know you're trying to focus on your breath or focus on your mantra and then uh you're focused on it but you know then you start thinking about something else that's your mind uh wandering and uh um you know in some tradition it's called the monkey mind it's just a monkey jumping from branch to branch you know liking to have fun uh that's the that's the mind wandering but where it goes you know it's like the type of thoughts you have you know is it intuition does the thought come from your brain does it come not from your brain most of your thoughts probably come you know from uh your brain and you're unconscious uh you know that's that's the uh, question you know we're trying to answer in that book and also where is it a doorway to your higher self um i personally think yes most of the meditation tradition are you try to quiet the mind to experience your mind wandering and see where it goes. Oh, I'm constantly thinking about that question and also seeing that it might not be beneficial to you. So lots of the meditation practice, for example, if you always worry about the same thing and it's running your life, you know, that's something you can realize during your meditation. And that's where your mind wandering takes you. It's like you're always thinking about the same thing. So I do think, you know, it's, uh, you call it the higher self. I would call it more knowing yourself. Mind wandering is a gateway to knowing uh, yourself more. Just looking at your thoughts, like some are intuition, some are annoying, some are pleasant. And also how, what do we know about, you know, these po thoughts popping up in your brain? And also what is the voluntary thoughts versus the involuntary thoughts? It's not like the line is is sharp. These are voluntary. I want to have these thoughts. And these are uh, not voluntary. They just pop up in my mind where I wasn't asking for anything. Quantum Living is a proud community partner in the Institute of Nerdic Sciences 2024 virtual conference. Beyond Global Mind Change in Action. Please join us virtually for four days of possibility, inspiration and transformation from the 30th of May until the 2nd of June. To claim your special 10% discount of the current registration price, please visit noetic.org forward slash conference 2024 and insert our exclusive promo code quantum 10 q u a n t u m followed by numeric 10 quantum 10 please join us i look forward to seeing you there okay lovely and just to ask another question that relates directly to the nature of the wandering mind i noticed long ago that i tend to think and speak in tangents, as someone has actually pointed out. So I start speaking on a topic and then soon off I go onto a tangent, moving away from the topic, often quite far. But most of the time I can come back to my starting point. And just to explain as, as a context, many people use the terms digression and tangent interchangeably. To me, the difference is that when I digress, I introduce a new message, which is only loosely linked to the main topic. It's like jumping onto a different branch of a tree that I'm climbing. For example, when I'm talking about my amazing holiday in Mallorca, I might say, I will digress for a moment, and then I'll tell you about the event where I picked up the brochure about holidays in Mallorca. Now, when I go off on a tangent, I am adding new additional information relevant to the topic. 
So it's more like going onto the thinner and smaller branches of the same big branch of the tree. So in my example, when describing my great holiday in Mallorca, I might start talking about the smaller and smaller details from the overview of my experience to the, uh, to the hotel I was staying at, to the amazing food and the particular dessert with the yummy local fruit, to how this fruit is being farmed and harvested. So I'm going off on a very long tangent, but it's still on the topic. Here is my question. How different is mind wandering from going off on a tangent and from digressing in terms of what's happening in our mind so um first i don't have like you know like a definite answer to that question because i don't think we we really know i mean the, we know the succession of thoughts you know one thought after another and how because what happens is that you know especially during meditation i would ask you to stop doing meditation, ask you, ask you what you think right now. And then you're going to tell me what you think. So then we can see, I ask you two minutes later, what you think right now. And we can see how the two thoughts are related. So we do these kind of studies, you know, where we just ask people about their thoughts and we can see, uh, yeah, what predict, you know, does your previous thoughts predict the next one? And we see that to some extent it does. But it's not like it does to, uh, uh, you know, it's like it's not like your thoughts from one hour ago predict the thoughts, you know, two hours later. What we found is that only the thought that just precedes your current thought influences the current thought. So with respect to your answer, you know, is digression. I think, you know, maybe in your mind, the coupling between thoughts is stronger than in other people's minds. So the thoughts stay on the same topic. Uh, in other people's mind, you know, they can go on a, on a tangent uh, a little bit more. Uh, or there is, you know, a different uh, type of coupling. There's actually models, you know, we're trying to also use computer models to model how the, you know, mind transition was from one thought uh, to the other. And it's it's very open question. Also, because it's very hard to study. You know, I, I can't read your mind 24-7, so we just need to stop ask people. And so that's a very poor measuring device. You know, it's like it's a very, uh, yeah, we don't get that many, that much information. Uh, every time we ask a question, then we have to wait and ask another question. So, uh, but, you know, there's, the research is progressing. So, yeah, in terms of, you know, about your specific experience, I would just say maybe you have, in terms of the transition between your thoughts, you have, you know, a different brain wiring that keeps you kind of tied to the same topics compared to other people who are digressing. Okay, right. Okay, well, actually do both. I was just curious about the relationship. Now, you mentioned that it is difficult to measure that activity. Mm -hmm. Do you measure the brain activity during meditation and mediumships to look at the difference in the actual brain activity that you can see on your instruments, showing the difference between the different states of mind. Absolutely. Yeah. We use uh, brain waves. So that's how we, uh, so I'm, I'm actually primarily uh, expert in brainwave uh, processing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's how I started my career. Uh, so that's how we measure people, people's brain. But the brain waves are very noisy. Actually, if you want to know what people thought, think, it's actually much better to ask them. We can't <laughs> read their brain with the brain waves. Uh, we can with some, you know, it's like maybe in 10 years, you know, we might be able to. But the brain waves are, you know, they're just electrodes on the scalp uh, and they're very noisy. Sometimes with some epileptic patients, we are able to put electrode inside their brain. And then we can almost read their thoughts because the signal is so much better. But, you know, uh, when we do the brainwave analysis, we basically need a lot of people and we need to, you know, we need a lot of time uh, during the experiment. And then we just average everything and we get an answer. Okay, that's the average. 
here for everybody. So we don't we just get average answer for the brain waves if you want. We'll say, oh, your average brain wave when you are accurate at your intuition is that. And your average brain wave when you are not accurate at your intuition is that. So we actually have a paper like this with a medium where uh, our brain wave for accurate intuition was different, our brain wave for non-accurate uh, intuition. But it's just uh yeah, we we just need to average a lot of response. We can't just read your mind with your brainwave unless, like Elon Musk, you know, we put tons of electrodes inside your your brain, then we will be able to read your thoughts. But right now, I don't think even we have the technology to read your thoughts, even if we put you know a thousand electrodes in your in your brain. But we will be able to. Yeah, um, one one because, day. Yeah. One day. Yeah. Just not too far, like 10 years from now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's good. In fact, uh, you know, some time ago, I was um, I was just writing down my thoughts about something that I was that was a project or something or other, some insight, and and then I stopped and I thought to myself, we should have a thought recorder. I'd love to have a thought recorder so that I could rec rather than writing down or typing my thoughts to record them. I would like to have a thought recorder. I can just press a button, maybe on my head, <laughs> to record my thoughts so that I could play them back in some form and maybe transcribe into into text. Anyway, a thought recorder. So that that's another invention. <laughs> yeah, not not impossible. I mean, right now it's just much easier. You have a thought recorder that's your yeah. hand writing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, but also I was mentioning Elon Musk because some people might not know, you know, he has like, he's, you know, one of the billionaires, but some people has does not, do not know. He has this company called Neuralink that just intend to put lots of electrodes in people's brain for doing exactly that. Uh, I mean, right now the company is more to, you know, for treating patients, but his goal is also to download his brain to a computer or something uh anyway he has this uh this dream so that's why i was mentioning Elon Musk, and maybe you will be able to write down your thoughts in real time but yeah your hand is still you know like uh that's we have our hands or our voice <laughs> and it's still we probably yeah. won't be able to go much faster i mean we can think faster than we can talk but yeah, I don't think it's, uh, you know, you don't want to put like a thousand extras in your brain to really be able to to speed up the note writing. You want to be able to give commands and people can do that. Like you have paralyzed patients uh, where, you know, we would implant electrodes and we can read their thoughts. They would talk through the computer. Uh, so this is already, uh, this is already possible. If it was like, there was a breakthrough last year. There's videos on the internet where a patient is able to talk, you know, a patient that's completely paralyzed is able to talk through uh, this device uh, almost in, in, in real time. And what, what happens is that the electrodes are in what we call is motor areas. So they're in part of the uh, uh, brain that controls uh, lips and things like that. And he can't move his lips, he's paralyzed, but his neurons are still active in that region. And basically the the uh, computer can detect these neurons are active and what part of the, you know, what what he wants to say. And they're able to decode his sentence. And it's very impressive. You know, I encourage people to look at the video. I think if you uh, Google, you know, patient uh, talking through computer, you'll find it. Interesting. So it's it's not like you know Star Trek yeah. the series when Spock could place his hand on your on your head mm -hmm. uh, in a particular way, and then he would connect with your thoughts and he could see your, your thoughts. <laughs> and that's what, well, you know, futuristic, but who knows? Maybe maybe one day. Okay, as I said in my intro. We usually associate intuition with the relaxed state of mind. 
But I believe that the opposite is also true, that our heightened state can also open the door to our sixth sense and receive information from the quantum field we would not normally have. I'd like to share my personal experience, which validates this point, and I'd love to hear your view on that. Many years ago, I lived in Paris, in France. I was just learning the language and the environment, the culture were unfamiliar. And so my mind was in a heightened state for the first few months. I'd say probably in high beta brainwaves. Strongly focused on my environment. So because I had to constantly decode it with all my senses to understand it beyond the language I was still learning. One day, my new bilingual friends invited me over for lunch. Since I didn't know the city at that stage, we met at my place, then walked to the metro station, took a train, got off the train, walked for a few minutes across a number of streets to their apartment block, then took the lift and got to their apartment. We were chatting all the time, so I wasn't paying any attention to where we were. I was just following them. After lunch, they drove me back home. A few weeks later, they invited me over again, and my friend said, don't worry, I'll come and pick you up at 12. On that day, for some reason, about 11 o'clock, I decided to get there by myself, as I didn't want to bother my friend again, knowing that I didn't have their address or even their phone number. I didn't remember the route we took, which metro line, which station we got off, the suburb or street number, nothing. And yet, I felt this strange sense of peace and guidance, so I went. I walked to the metro station, and from that point on, I was purely guided by my intuition. I was in a heightened state, a heightened trance almost. On the train, I tuned my awareness inwards until I felt that I needed to get off at the next station. I walked in the direction I felt was right, taking the right turns, until I saw the apartment block that looked familiar. It had a security entrance, so I had to press the buzzer to get the door opened. Except that I didn't remember the number. <laughs> but within a few seconds, someone was leaving the building, so I smiled and said, Bonjour, monsieur, comment allez-vous? And got through the open door. <laughs> I couldn't take the lift as I didn't know to which floor. So I took the stairs. Again, highly focused, I walked slowly, waiting for the sign that I'm on the right floor. On the fifth floor, I felt, this is it. Now, there were four doors. Which one is my friend's? My intuition pointed me towards one door. I knocked, the door opened, and, to my great relief, I saw my friend. His jaw dropped to the floor. <laughs> How did you get here? I was just about to leave to pick you up. Now, that was a totally crazy, unexplainable and intense experience. What do you think had happened there? Um, yeah, it's very interesting. First, uh, congratulations. I mean, I'm from Paris, so and there's 20 lines of metro, so you got to pick the right one. And, uh, yeah, they go in all directions. And um, I don't know. You know, there's lots of things we don't know, you know, from a science, you know, what do you scientist. Think? We only know what we'd be tested on. If I was to do, you know, a control experiments, I would make sure first I would try to find people who can get into this kind of trance and then uh, probably take you the first time blindfolded. And then the second time you would try to find your way. And then, you know, I would do it in 10 different locations so I can be sure that, you know, it's not a chance that you find the right location. 
And that's the way I would do it. And then I would be able to say, yeah, I mean, you know, it's like uh, she had access to some information that she might not have been able to access otherwise. I would blindfold you, but I would also put earphones on your <laughs> and then and, and then I would have you on the wheelchair so you can't know how many steps <laughs> <laughs> okay so total isolation from from the environment total isolation yeah, yeah. so there's no sensory leakage yes and and that that's actually very interesting because one possible scenario or one theory could be that our unconscious mind is recording our environment even when we are not paying conscious attention to it. So in other words, even though I was engrossed in a conversation with my friends, so I wasn't really paying attention or which train, which station, which number, whatever, my subconscious mind was still recording that information. So when I decided to, to retrace my steps, I somehow got access to that information from my unconscious mind. That that's one possible uh, theory, other than coming as my intuition completely yeah. from the quantum field. I agree. Which one is more plausible for you? I think the the second one is more plausible. It's not from the unconscious. Uh, let's see, you feel it's from you know something else. When I mean, you call it the quantum field, I would say you know some phenomena we don't understand yet, uh, and you know that's how you could try to test it. Um, yeah. Okay. Now I would like to invite you, Arno, to please tell us more about the upcoming huge event starting on May the 30th, the IONS 2024 virtual conference, Beyond Global Mind Change in Action, that you are a part of, as I understand. What is so special about it and why is it important? Yeah, so the IONS conference, and then so you can register at uh, www.noetic.org. It's about, you know, discussing the questions we've just been talking about. Uh, we've just not one, you know, scientist, but more, more experts, some scientists, some spiritual leaders, you know, Deepak Chopra will be there talking with others. And then you have all the scientists at IONS. Uh, talking as well, along with other scientists, and you know, discussing all these topics. Where are we? What has been shown? You know, uh, where are we going next? Um, yeah, and and sharing. It's a community, you know. So sharing with the uh, community and getting together. This is an online conference. Uh, uh, there will be more in-person uh, events uh, next year. Uh, this year is still online, but it's a, it's not a standard online conference. It's just not Zoom meetings. It has, uh, uh, you know, it's on the spe special platform. So there's lots of breakouts, et cetera, where people can exchange with each other. That's the goal, you know, is to uh, also foster uh, the community. So, you know, have the these kind of dialogues with people, and lots of them more expert than me. And also, yeah exchange with the community. So you are going global, obviously, with this. It's, so it's a global conference. And it looks like it is a logistically very complex event because not only you have presentations, but you have, as I understand, workshops, breakout rooms. How many participants are you expecting? Do you know? Uh, this I wouldn't be able to tell you. In the excess of 1,000, I would say. Wow. Yeah, so to organize, what, say, 1,000 participants. And this will be going on for four days, by the way. So so not yeah. just one day. But, yeah, it is. it, it does look like a very, very complex logistically <laughs> event to, to organize. Mm -hmm. But with the list of the speakers and topics to be presented, what is your favorite topic? Yeah, my favorite topic is, you know, the one we talked about. I mean, consciousness, I'm passionate about, yeah, understanding you know, the link between, you know, the world as we perceive it and our feeling of being, you know, what's the, what's the, is there a scientific explanation to all this, you know, what's the, yeah, looking into the mystery. It's really fun, you know, 
and uh, I'm just lucky to be doing yes. what I like. Well, I don't know. Time is catching up with us. So, would you like to share any final thoughts and comments and a summary of this conversation? Anything that you would like to leave our audience with? As I've mentioned, I will include all the links, all more information about you with all the links to your online presence, the institute and the conference in the podcast show notes and in your guest profile. But just to wrap up this conversation, what would you like to leave our audience with? Okay, as a, as a conclusion, I'm going to read you a quote by Rupert Spira. Uh, Thoughts are just like birds flying across the sky of awareness. They appear and disappear in the boundless space of our being. Beautiful and and so very apropos <laughs> to our conversation. Well, Arno, thank you so much for coming on Quantum Living. It's been such a pleasure to have you on my show. And then we had very interesting conversation. And I am looking forward to connecting with you at the IONS conference. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.